The following podcast contains true stories of sex, kink, gender, or body image. Thanks for being a consenting adult, because here we go. All of my life, I've never fit, but I won't complain and I won't quit. I am enormous, get used to it. Everyone tells me I'm too much. Maybe it's just you're not enough for me. Can't you see? I'm the kind of woman I'm supposed to be. Hi there, and welcome to the Body Storytelling Podcast. I'm sexual folklorist Dixie Delatour, and this week we have a story from queer poet and filmmaker Blythe Baldwin. Hello there, you beautiful human. If you were listening last week, you heard Barbie, one of my super fans, who talked about how my storytelling workshop helped them not just get their dream job, but keep their trans and non binary family safe from anti trans legislation in the South. That blew me away. There's a second part that ties into that that I'm going to tell you about this week. Is it directly related? No. Is it something that's going to change your life? Also, no. But it's changing my life. And if it changes my life, there is a chance, there's a correlation that it could affect your life as well. I hear all the time that body changes lives and these pieces are starting to fit together so that I can do more of that. It's been kind of hard to do it when I haven't been producing live shows because live shows are where shit happens. You're probably not going to take the time to send me an email and say, oh my God, I was at your show last night and you're not going to believe how everything changed for me. Some people do that, but most are like, oh, I don't want to bother anybody. Oh, they keep it to themselves. But if we're together in person, you're probably going to walk up to me and go, hi, I have to tell you this thing because I have one of those faces. You can look at me and you're gonna go, I can tell Dixie. If I can tell anybody, I can tell Dixie. Happens to me all the time. (laughs) In fact, it happened today. (laughs) Okay, this is really embarrassing. This is a segue. This is not the life-changing part. This is a what happened today part. I am embarrassed to admit that I have had two rings, one on each middle finger, for a very long time (laughs) and sometimes you get your ring stuck and maybe you try and use a little mayonnaise or use a little soap or or use a little dental floss to try and get the ring off and it doesn't work well I've been doing that from time to time for a while on these rings one in particular the one on my right hand has been there for years both of them have been there over a year but one of them is multiple years So this morning I woke up and my middle finger really hurt on my right hand. And it's been getting worse and worse all the time. And one of the reasons I haven't been doing anything about it is because I gained a lot of weight during the pandemic. And I was doing that self-blame thing you do where this is my fault. I gained a bunch of weight. No wonder I can't get my rings off. Something is wrong with me. I'm the problem. Well, today the pain was especially bad. And I'm about to go camping for a week, which means if I have any medical problems, I probably don't want to deal with them while I'm off in the woods. So I started thinking about, well, you're packing, well, you're getting ready. Maybe you should also finally take care of this problem. I already knew that it wasn't going to work if I used dental floss or soap or mayonnaise. Mayonnaise on your finger is gross, by the way. So I was looking it up online. And the advice I found said, go to a firehouse and they can remove your rings. Well, that's way better than going to the ER. The last two times I've been to the ER, it's been over 12 hours in the waiting room and I'm packing to leave really soon. So I did not want to do that. Plus, I was extra embarrassed to go, hi, I'm here at the ER because I gained so much weight in my hands. I can't get these fucking rings off. Yes. Yes. I beat myself up about this. Can you tell? So I look it up, it says, go to the firehouse. I'm like, 
really? So I call. I call the number of the firehouse, which apparently goes to every firehouse in San Francisco. It was the main number, and it said, here's 20 minutes worth of recordings. If you want to serve a subpoena, press 23. If you want to check on the employment history of a fireman, press 12. Like, it was a very long recording. And eventually, it stopped and said, if none of those are the solution to your problem, just wait on the line. And finally, someone answers and says, hi, how can I help you? And I'm like, I have rings stuck on my hand and I cannot get them off. And they're really starting to hurt because they're cutting into my skin. I read that I can go to a firehouse and they take my rings off. Is that true? And the guy on the other line said, absolutely. Just go to the firehouse near you. They'll cut your rings off. So I'm still embarrassed. I'm still going, oh my God, how did my life come to this? But I got in the car and I drove to the nearest firehouse and I rang the doorbell. And after quite a while, a bunch of firemen came to the front door and looked at me like, did you ring our doorbell accidentally? Is there a problem? And I'm like, hi, the internet says that I can get you to cut off some rings that are stuck on my hands. Is that true? And one of them is obviously brand new and goes, is that true? And the other one goes, yeah, yeah, we do that. (laughs) The older firemen, obviously their boss, said, come on in, sit down on a bench. We'll get all the equipment. And they start pulling things out of the side of the fire engine. This is obviously the kit that has all the emergency. It's not jaws of life, but it feels like that's probably in the general direction they're headed. And... The newbie fireman is asking questions and the other fireman who's going to be doing it is just like, so have you tried dental floss? Have you tried mayonnaise? Have you tried soap? And I'm like, I swear to God, I'm not an idiot. I did all of those things multiple times. These rings have been on for years, y'all. I cannot get them off. I gained a lot of weight during the pandemic and they are like starting to affect the way my body is growing. It's sort of like waist training, if you know anything about corsets, how they can shape everything permanently, maybe even adjust your ribs, who knows? But my finger is starting to look different. And I said, I did it all. And they're like, are you sure you want us to cut it off though? Like, what about this ring? I'm like, it's a $5 ring, I don't care. Just take it off. The guy asked me three times as he gets the equipment, they've got this strange thing that you have to like, you, you clamp it down on the ring and then you start uh, twisting it so that it gets tighter and tighter and tighter till it's got a good grip and then it can cut through. And as he's doing it, he keeps going, are you sure? Are you sure? And I'm like, I've never been more sure of anything in my life. Just get it off. I'm getting really scared. My hand is starting to hurt. And eventually I hear it snap. And I'm worried that it might be my finger that just snapped. The assistant, the brand new fireman is going, huh, wow, look at that. That's so cool. And the older fireman is kind of overseeing the whole process. Yep, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. I tell them there's another one on my left hand. It's different. It's a much thicker ring. It's actually made of hematite, which is supposed to ward off bad spirits. But that didn't work because now I can't get the fucking ring off. And I'm like, what about this one? And they try to cut that one multiple times and they cannot make a dent in the metal. It's just, it will not even clamp into the metal. So they said, but you've tried so many times to get this thing off with lubricant. And I'm like, well, honestly, I spent more time on the other hand. So if you want to give it a try, go for it. And they go get some industrial lubricant. This stuff was great. And they lube up my hand, which felt really interesting. And (laughs) eventually I feel the ring starting to move over my knuckle and I start gasping. And he's like, oh my God, are you okay? Thinking he's breaking my finger. And I'm like, no, no, it's moving. It's coming off. I feel it coming off. So one had to be cut off. One had to be lubed off. And I was so happy. I just kept looking at my fingers, which are now permanently indented. Both my middle fingers have indentations that I hope will go back to normal. I don't know. They gave me ice packs and said, here, keep these things on them. Hopefully the blood flow will get going a lot better. And (laughs) I'm just so happy. I just keep saying thank you. I'm like, oh my God, this has been terrifying. These rings have been on my hands for years. I couldn't get them off and I just didn't want to go to the ER. I just, I didn't want to come here to the firehouse. And 
<laughs> the one who's more experienced said, yeah, this isn't usually what we get a call to the firehouse for. Um, usually when somebody wants something cut off at the firehouse, it's on their dick. And I was like, uh, really? And they're like, yeah. Often it'll just be like, a, and they look at each other like, should we say this to her? And I'm like, it's like a cock ring and it gets stuck. And they're like, yeah, like surprised that I knew what a cock ring was. And I'm like, so people get cock rings stuck on their dick and then they have to go to the firehouse to have you guys remove it. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, have you ever seen anybody lose a scrotum or anything? Because I've heard that the blood flow problem can do things like that. And they're like, well, we haven't lost a scrotum yet. But they're looking at each other like, what is happening? So I didn't give them any inclination that I was the person that you could talk about getting a cock ring stuck on your dick. But they felt they could say that to me. And I felt kind of honored. And I'm like, well, I'm a sexual folklorist. Thank you for that. That was really cool information. Now, if anybody tells me that they've got their cock ring stuck and they're freaking out, they don't have to wait 12 hours in the ER. They can just go to the local firehouse and have really attractive firemen cut it off their dick. So good to know, right? We learned something this week. I have the rings off my hand. I'm ashamed that I was so embarrassed about gaining weight that I let it get to this point. But they were super kind and I didn't feel embarrassed in front of them. I just felt embarrassed because I embarrassed myself by being stupid, by feeling shame over something that happened to so many people during the pandemic. If you have a story like that, if you gain weight over the pandemic, it would make me feel more normal to hear that from you too. So you know how to contact me. I'd like to hear your story as well. And now we're gonna get to the sequel to last week's Barbie anti-trans legislation story. That particular story came to me on like a Tuesday that they were getting away from a state in the South where they and their children didn't feel safe and moving across the country to Washington State, which has protections in place. And I was so proud to hear that story. And a few days later, I had an appointment to go to what was billed as an in-person grand reopening for an event called Shut Up and Write, which is something I used to go to all the time before the pandemic. It is a nationwide writing event where you get together in cafes and you keep an eye on each other's computers and somebody can go to the bathroom and they don't have to pack everything up or they can go get a refill on their coffee. And they just kind of work in what we now call body doubling. But at the time it was just like, help each other focus, sit at a big table in a coffee house and let's all work together. 90 minute sprints, then we take a break, we stretch, decide if we wanna do another 90 minute sprint. I loved this thing. I got so much work done when I went to Shut Up and Write. And when I saw that they were announcing an in-person grand reopening, I was like, a lot of people have gone back to events. What's going on? Why are they having a grand reopening for in-person? I know that Shut Up and Write has been doing in-person events. So I went. I was very curious. There were free drinks. There was a jazz band. It was really cool. And it was more social than writing. And I sat down next to somebody. And I said, hi, my name's Dixie, what's yours? And he tells me he's the founder of Shut Up and Write. And I'm like, oh my God, it started in San Francisco. I know you guys are national. And his name was Rennie and he said, yeah, yeah, we started here over 15 years ago. And I told him how much I loved it, how how the format worked so well for me and I'd missed it so much during the pandemic and just didn't wanna do it on Zoom. And I said, so tell me, why are you doing an in-person grand reopening? Why is that happening now in like June of 2023? And he says, well, we throw events all over the country. And San Francisco is the only city that is pushing back on reopening. He had no idea what that meant to me to hear. I mean, honestly, I thought it was me. I thought something was wrong with my show, that people didn't value it, that it just, you know, sometimes you tell yourself, well, things have moved on. I'm no longer relevant, I guess. But to hear that it was a problem that everyone was battling and it was specific to San Francisco 
really changed things for me. I felt so much lighter. I felt like, oh my God, all I needed was another person or another organization's perspective to understand what was happening. I woke up the next morning feeling so much lighter and feeling like I understood a problem I'd been struggling with for the last three years. No, it it didn't affect all three years. I mean, it was a pandemic and everything was shut down, but I've been trying to figure this out for a long time. And after hearing Barbie's story, and after having Rennie tell me what was going on with their organization, I looked out the window and there sat Edna the minivan. And all I've been doing since I brought that van home from Tucson when my mom died, and I decided the story was just too good, I couldn't let it be sold off, I had to keep that van. And I've been beating myself up going, why are you doing that? You're just going to get parking tickets. You just have to move it every week. Why do you have it? And I looked out the window at Edna the minivan and went, oh, I think I get it. So it's all coming together. I don't know what's possible. I don't know what I can do on my own. But with your help, I think things are going to start happening in other cities really soon. I'd love to know if you've always wanted to see body in your city. I mean, knowing that I'm wanted, that, that just changes my life. So you know how to get me, bodystorytelling at gmail.com. Tell me your story. Tell me you want me to come there. Tell me the venue I should come to. Tell me the friends you would bring with you. Tell me about your experiences listening to the podcast. That's what I need right now. Can you do that for me, please? Have you been searching for more meaningful connections? Questioning parts of your identity? Exploring new aspects of your sexuality? I want to tell you about Field. It's a dating app that welcomes all of it. Field is the evolution of dating, and it's a positive space for intense human experiences. I've been on the Field app for a while now, and I'm having such fun there. I love that Field doesn't restrict you to the standard binary dating options because you contain multitudes, don't you? With more than 20 sexuality and gender identity options to choose from, everyone has a place on Field. And so do all types of interests and desires, which members can share right on their profiles. You're free to express your true desires on Field. Whether you're looking for a friend, a friend with benefit, or an MFF, a male-male-female encounter, There is a community on field waiting to welcome you. Explore solo or bring your partner along for the adventure. You can pair profiles with a partner to more easily explore ethical non-monogamy or polyamory. If your circle gets even bigger, use the group chat option to create a digital polycule for platonic connections or for group play. Explore your authentic self, forge deeper connections, and live a life in vivid color on field. And here's something new. For a limited time, listeners of the Body Storytelling Podcast will receive a free month of Majestic Membership, their premium tier, when they download the Field app for the first time. Just use the link in our show notes to download Field or head to field.co slash B-A-W-D-Y and access one free month of Majestic Membership. Pro tip, please allow 24 hours for this to activate. Remember, that's F-E-E-L-D dot co slash body. And I can't wait to meet you on field. Oh, it's time for a story. And I think you're going to be excited about this one because this person is a true wordsmith. Just listen to the flow. Listen to the choice of words and the language as you listen to this story. Plus, it's kinky and it's queer. Who wouldn't love those things? You and me, we love them. So let me tell you about this week's storyteller. Blythe Baldwin is a poet, storyteller, community organizer, and filmmaker living in Oakland, California. She has participated in Litquake's Lit Crawl and has performed slam poetry and storytelling for over 12 years throughout the Bay Area and beyond. She has spun yarns at several storytelling events in the Bay Area, including The Shout, Story Showdown, and Body Storytelling. This storyteller is Blythe Baldwin. Oh my. 
Ay. <laughs> oh, you sexy motherfuckers. You ready for a ride? Yeah, let's go there. There's a mountain in this story, too. <laughs> There are fingertips grazing through my pubes, and as they do, a flurry of violet electromagnetic shocks discharge into the skin below them. My cunt is thunder cunt mountain right now. <laughs> and I am soaking wet. <laughs> and as the fingertips graze lower to the source of the wetness, the shocks become more alarming and more erratic in their placement. <laughs> My brain is racing. Oh, shit, why am I suddenly more conductive? What causes that? Body fluids? Sweat? Urine? Shit, is vaginal lubricant conductive? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Can we just like pull this back a little bit? I need you to like move away from there because I'm really afraid that it's gonna shock me really hard inside of my clit. You might be wondering, what would compel a person to become electrified in the bedroom? Like most kinksters, I started early and often and discovered that I was kinky in the most innocuous of ways. In high school, I was hot shit on the varsity lacrosse team at my boarding school in New Hampshire. <laughs> Cradle it. So, when Carrie, the sports medicine trainer at my boarding school, discovered that I was having problems with my knee, she attached a TENS and ESM unit to it to help me relieve pain and build up the strength in my, in my thigh. And I liked it a little too much. <laughs> so at the time, I really wasn't aware of whether there was any application for electricity in the bedroom. So I, I thought, and I thought, oh, I'll write to my friend Kelly in San Francisco. She was a little bit older and way kinkier than I am. So I wrote to her and I said, is there any use for this in the bedroom with kinksters? And she wrote back, absolutely yes. <laughs> At the end of my tenure of boarding school, my first love broke my heart, and I moved back to the Bay Area just limping with it in my chest. So Kelly decided that she would arrange a sleepover for us in her apartment in San Francisco to cheer me up. I come over, and she is like a San Francisco cliche for the early 2000s. Long, blonde dreadlocks, tall, dancer's body, because she was a go-go dancer by night, and a, a co-op grocery worker by day, right? <laughs> Can't make this shit up. <laughs> What's up, Rainbow Grocery? I see you. So, she invites me over. We catch up over dinner. We watch The Young Frankenstein, because I love The Young Frankenstein. <laughs> and then she gives me a crash... <laughs> She gives me a crash course. You didn't think I could do that. She gives me a crash course in her violet wand. Now, violet wands are an e-stim device that are just amazing and stupendous. They have such a broad range of uses, and the sensations that they, they can give you are, are equally as varied, if not more so. Anything from like warm champagne tingly bubbles to like a stream of electroshocks to just like menacing zaps and then hot panting knife-like slicing, right? Perfect, I'm in heaven. After that night, I was a fucking convert. And when I say fucking convert, I mean the fucking part. <laughs> but those fuckers are goddamn expensive. I mean, really, they start at the low end at like 400 for a kid, run all the way up to 700, and by the time you know it, if you get into this fetish as a lifelong habit, you're like dropping the net worth of a small European compact fucking car. <laughs> it was not for my beer budget lifestyle at all. <laughs> so I lusted after them. Every time I heard that bzzz at a play party, I was just following people around like a puppy dog. Please zap me. Please zap me. I'll do anything. <laughs> right? It wasn't for me. A couple years ago, my fiance Gina is giving me shit over Gchat Messenger about how our nipple clamps are for pussies. Right? <laughs> I can just picture her in her little lab coat, all five foot six of her tucked into the door frame, her wavy honey brown hair falling into her face as she pushes her glasses up and types into the phone, get me something with more bite. <laughs> I'm off like a shot to JT's stockroom. <laughs> I'm looking through it, I'm getting some clamps, I'm like, good, good, right before I purchase, little flashing box, advertising Kink Lab's neon wand. What the fuck is a neon wand, right? The neon wand is like a less sassy little sibling of the violet wand. And for $99, it was mine. <laughs> so I tell Gina, more bite is coming. And she says, I promise, I will zap the shit out of you. <laughs> the day arrives, the box gets there, we tear into it. And after reading through the warning labels and the instruction manual and the warranty, I think, at least twice, 
we're like, okay, we're good to go, right? It's a plug and play kind of thing. It looks like some kind of Apple product from fucking hell. All slick white web 2.0 violet attachments because purple is our favorite color, right? We don't fuck around. So we take off all of each other's clothes, slowly strip each other. No jewelry, no washes, no clothing of any kind, right? And then we plug the wand in. Now, the wand comes with like a couple different attachments, uh, glass electrodes, and they glow violet, like I said. And so we started to run them through their courses. And we're running them over our arms at first. And then we're getting more adventurous on the belly, and then the chest, and then the thighs. And it's kind of fun, you know, to just trade back and forth with each other and turn up the thing and surprise each other. And now, the thing about it is that electricity does not discriminate about who it wants to fuck with. <laughs> it wants to get to the closest, less path of resistance that it can, right? So if you're holding the wand too close, like we discovered to yourself, as you attempt to administer a shock to your partner, it will discharge onto you. <laughs> Accidental shocks are inevitable, but very, very fun. Our reactions were priceless. We were flushed, we were laughing, we were turned on. It's the best kind of sex you can have with somebody you dig, right? So after this point, I decide, you know, I tell her, attachments are great and everything, but like, I need something more. And I pull out the body compact, contact probe. Now, this is a line that if you hold on to it, you can push sparks into your partner's skin. And if they hold on to it, you can pull sparks through their skin, right? L very nasty, lots of fun. <laughs> so I start to shock Gina, and I'm shocking her on her tits, and she's like, ooh, man, she's squealing and squirming. Just, <laughs> and I'm loving it. Like, there is nothing more than a sub that is squealing and squirming that gets me hotter like that. I was just so excited. So she's starting to get, like, to her, her end point. She's, she's saying, you know, come on, give me the thing. Give me the thing. I want to zap you now. You know, I'm getting bored of this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, one, one more thing. Roll on to your belly. And she's like, okay. So she does. And I pick up the Wartenberg wheel that was sitting on the, bed, the bedside table, right? And some of these people are, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's metal, it's very conductive, right? So I just run the handle of it over her shoulder and she shudders. <sighs> and I said, I thought you'd like that because it feels like a hot knife slicing through your skin, right? So I just start to peel her like a grape, alternating between the handle and the spiny end. And I'm watching these little violet shocks come off each little prong as it races over her body and she's just loving it. And then she's like, all right, enough, give me the thing. And I'm like, all right, and I hand it off to her. And she's like, okay, it's my turn now. She gets very excited and she starts buzzing on me and she goes right after my nipple rings, right? Because this is bringing out her sadist side strong. <laughs> the metal is conductive inside my nipples, right? <laughs> zap, zap, dee, zap, zap. <laughs> it's very intense, Gina. <sighs> so after that, she moves on to my belly. And then she gets down into my thighs. And these are a sweet spot because old habits die hard, right? Way back to high school. And she's running them all over my thighs. And then she gets to my pubes. And I am wet at this point, right? And that's when Thunderbush Mountain starts happening. And I'm like, whoa, taco, which is our yellow light word, right? Taco, taco. It's a little spicy. Let me just turn over my belly if that's OK. And she says, OK. So I do, and I get on my belly, and right away she goes after my ass like a synthesizer. Just zap, 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 zap. Really? And she's like, ha ha, I have the Wartenberg wheel. I'm like, oh, God. So she starts running it all over me, and then she ditches that, and she just starts running her fingertips in slow, scrawling S-shapes, curves all over my back. She traces the lines of my tribal tattoo, right? And I'm losing my shit just huffing ozone off my forearms. Ozone is a byproduct of a violet or neon wand. It's a smell, and it smells sweet. It smells like the air before a thunderstorm or snow or rain. It smells like Gina does, right? I am losing my shit. Burrito, I say for it out. And she's like, what, was that too much? I'm like, no, you better drop that fucking thing and screw me right now. So she says, all right, up on your knees, ass up, stay. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right into my forearms. She goes away for a minute, she comes back with some things, and then I feel lube in my asshole. Just a slow, lazy circle that nosedives deep. And then withdraws. And then the purple butt plug. I told you, purple is our favorite color. Starts to sink its way until she just nudges it in there, real snug, right? 
And at that point, she starts to just bury her fingers into my cunt. It's one, joined by two, joined by three, joined by four. Her thumb is rubbing against my clit, and she is pounding me hell for leather, just like I like, because my shit's kind of like an engine, right? Like, it needs that screwdriver and just with the hammer to get me really going, right? So she is definitely pounding at home. The motor is running. I'm ready to go. And as she's doing this, all of a sudden I hear this bzzz, and I thought we were done with the wand until I realize it's the vibrator snugged up against the butt plug in my ass. My ass is going insane with tickles. My cunt is being filled and fucked. Everything is throbbing inside. And when I come, my gut catches first, and I come so hard that I crush her knuckles in waves. <laughs> when I regain my wits, I tell her, do not let go of that, signaling her vibrator, right? I roll her over onto her stomach and kiss a slow trail of what I like to call 90s kisses, because they're really sloppy, and I found out I could do that when I was listening to Dave Matthews with her once. <laughs> What's up, Dave? So kiss a trail of sloppy 90s kisses down her back, spread her legs, lay down between them, and just in the catcher position, right over her ass. So she starts to use the vibrator on her clit from below her. And I spread her ass, and I start to eat her out in kind of like weird reverse, up, upside down, <laughs> and from behind her. And I'm tongue-fucking her that way. And she's getting very wet. She's getting very excited. And right when she's about to lose it, because I can feel it quivering like it does, <laughs> I pull up and start rimming her like a fucking maniac, just burying my tongue in her ass. And when she comes, she squeals just like she did when I zapped her with the wand, right? Afterwards, we're laying there in bed, and I have my arms wrapped around this woman because I'm the big spoon. I have my arms wrapped around this woman I love who has my whole fucking goddamn heart. And I'm looking over at the bedside table and I see the wand that I've always wanted and never been able to get. And I think to myself, that's amazing. And I fall asleep just like that in a room full of possibilities I would never have imagined would be mine.
That song was Danger, High Voltage by Electric Six. COVID-19 and the pandemic impacted creative communities around the world. Body was hit especially hard. We're still here, but only through the generosity of people like those who support us on Patreon. Patreon is a way to provide ongoing monthly support for the things you love. I have missed being on stage. I've missed putting on shows. I've missed helping people find their story and watching them get a standing ovation in front of hundreds of people. But I think we're at a point where we can start talking about coming back from it. But that requires money. So support us on Patreon. It's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash body. Or you can support us on Cash App, on Buy Me A Coffee, on PayPal, on Venmo, pretty much anywhere. It means so much. Every dollar helps. It helps us come back from this and maybe even produce new shows in new cities that are closer to you. That's my dream. So go to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash body. Support us at whatever level you can. And thanks in advance for your support. Well, that's our time for this week. Could I ask, I'm going to be away this week. I'm going to be mostly off grid. It would be so exciting to come back and find a written review from you for the Body Storytelling Podcast. I'd love to come back and see that you let me know what you think. You're probably going to do it on Apple Podcasts. They make it easiest to write a written review. But if not there, give us five stars wherever you listen to podcasts or definitely, not or, and definitely subscribe. Please and thank you. I'd appreciate it. And while I'm saying thank you, let me say thank you to the people who make this podcast possible. Thank you to David Grossoff, Donald Mooney, Mosa Maxwell-Smith, Roiland James, and podcast producer Roman Den Houdeker. I'm sexual folklorist Dixie Delatour, and this has been episode 271 of the Body Storytelling Podcast. Thanks for listening. Oh,